to the Mind and Matter podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Mark Matson. Mark Matson is currently an adjunct professor of neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He is semi-retired. He spent many years uh, running a laboratory of his own. He's the former chief of the National Institute of Aging, the Laboratory of Neurosciences over there. And his lab has studied a number of things over the years, but he's done a lot of work on aging and longevity, metabolism, subjects like intermittent fasting and how different feeding schedules affect animal physiology, uh, looking at you know different aspects of metabolism and how they re- relate to diets and patterns of eating. Um, we talked about intermittent fasting on a daily basis. We talked about the so-called 5-2 diet. We talked about how the body uses energy in the form of glucose or in the form, form of ketones. So when we fast or we eat a ketogenic diet, we go into ketosis where we switch from using glucose for energy and we start using ketones for energy. We talked about some of the physiological consequences of those two different metabolic states. We talked about the importance in animals of switching between different metabolic states and why we might be adapted to that as a kind of general way of life. We talked about how things like fasting and feeding patterns impact things like disease risk. We talked about neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. We talked about how constantly eating boosts our risk for cancer and other forms of disease. We talked about the uh, food industry and the medical system in the United States and how that relates to all of the chronic diseases that are really uh, just a huge epidemic at this point. Um, And we talked about all sorts of different aspects of um, stressing the body in a way that actually leads to greater health. So that includes things like fasting. That includes things like exercise. Uh, We talked about the nervous system and neuroplasticity quite a bit as well. So if you're interested in human biology, especially how um, feeding patterns and intermittent fasting affect biology, everything from the brain to metabolism and aging, this is a really interesting episode for you. As always, I want to remind you that I have a Substack, mindandmatter.substack.com. You will find all of the podcast content there in audio and video format. You will find my free weekly newsletter. And if you subscribe to that, you'll get podcast updates, including upcoming guests and topics, um, interesting research that ties into what I'm discussing on the show, and various other uh, video links and interesting pieces of things that I'm either working on and producing myself or that are influencing uh, what I'm thinking about and who I'm having on the show. If you become a paid subscriber, you'll get early access to episodes ahead of time, as well as some other benefits. And I just want to thank you for supporting the podcast in any way that you already are. That includes just tuning in or sharing your favorite episodes with family and friends. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen, and it's a handheld, pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters to get $50 off your Lumen device today. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Mark Madsen. You know, I started reading literature on aging, and there had been mouse and rat studies showing that daily caloric restriction, cutting back on calories, can extend lifespan of rats and mice uh, by a lot if it's initiated when the animals are young. Mm-hmm. Um, by kind of decreasing increments of ex- lifespan extension, the later it started in life, and then. There were, I'd also seen a, a, saw a paper from a group at National Institute on Aging, where I eventually ended up actually, 
where they showed that every other day food deprivation or every other day fasting extended lifespan of rats and mice. Uh, and so we had animal models of that are relevant to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke. And if you're interested, I can go to the details. But anyway, the bottom line, we have models, either they're genetic or neurotoxin based, or in the case of stroke, it's actually a surgical procedure where you shut off the blood supply transiently to the brain. We found if we maintain rats or mice on every other day fasting, uh, we, we start out by doing three months, and then we found we have to do it a minimum of two weeks to a month. But if we have them on intermittent fasting and then, for example, expose their brains to excitotoxins and models of Parkinson's or Huntington's disease, um, that neurons are resistant to de degenerating, and the functional outcome is it's preserved. Uh, so so be, being in the fasted state is protective against neurodegeneration. Uh, yes, but we found it, it can't be just a one-time fast. It, it has to be cumulative over a period of time. It, hmm. And, and hmm. We, we can get to it later, but uh, in all of our studies, and other people are finding this too, and it's even true to some extent in human studies, that it takes two weeks to a month of intermittent fasting to see robust effects on the brain and the heart. Um, and yeah, so mm -hmm. anyway, we, we can t talk about yep. what's happening during those two weeks. To yeah. A month. Well, let's say, let's say like, um, let's just start out with two, two simple things to orient people here. So first, can you just give us a, a simple definition of inter intermittent fasting? And then, you know, let's, let's say that someone starts intermittent fasting today and they're going to go for um, several weeks. Let's just say they're going to go weeks and weeks, daily intermittent fasting. Walk us through those several weeks in terms of what some of the major physiological changes are going to be. Okay, good. So intermittent fasting, uh, what it's not is a diet. The diet is what you eat, composition of your diet, and how much. Uh, intermittent fasting is an eating pattern. And it's any eating pattern that results in frequent, often periodic, uh, periods without any food sufficient to cause a metabolic switch from glucose to fats and ketones. So in humans, that takes about 12 to 14 hours uh, if you're not exercising, just kind of normal daily activities. Mm -hmm. If you exercise... A lot of people do this, actually. Say you get up in the morning after having not eaten anything, right, night before, and you go out the door and go on a run for an hour. Mm -hmm. At some time during that run, so during the night when you're sleeping, you'll be systems using glucose. Mm -hmm. Then when you go on the run, initially you'll be using glucose because you've only been fasting, say, eight, hour, eight to ten hours. And then at some point in your run, you're going to, it's going to start switching to ketones and that are derived from the fats. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was kind of an amateur endurance athlete, and um, this is kind of my explanation of uh, some people in endurance events. They'll be a, they'll start the race, and they'll be feeling pretty good, and then there'll be some time period where there's like a, a decrement in their performance. Mm -hmm. And then they'll get they'll get their second wind. So of course I don't think it's a second wind. I think it has to do with energy metabolism. Mm. So if you if you start the event uh, in a not in a ketogenic state, and then you're you're during the time you're switching from glucose to ketones, that takes time. It doesn't happen like one second your cells are using glucose, and the next they're using ketones. Mm -hmm. There's got to be signaling that the system, essentially the liver, uh, senses depletion of glucose, uh, and then fats release fatty acids into the blood, and they go into the liver and convert to ketones. So that takes many, many minutes 
tens of minutes. So minutes. So so from the point where you're actually running out of glucose, it's taking minutes before your body sort of senses that depletion and then switches you over to uh, to using ketones more. Yeah, many minutes, tens of minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so intermittent fasting. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of for humans typical intermittent fasting eating patterns that. Mm-hmm. people are use and, and a lot of clinical studies that we can talk about. Uh, one is a daily time restricted eating where the individual eats all of their food with only say within say a six to eight hour time window. Uh, so they're fasting for 16 to 18 hours, which is enough to cause the metabolic switch to occur. Um, I skip breakfast. I've done that since I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa, actually. And um, and I exercise before I eat lunch usually. Mm. So I you know, I've kind so of So you're going you're you're going at least partially into ketosis every day when you have that kind of pattern. Yeah, that's right. And um, that eating patterns in, in people who have a low body weight or, you know, not much body fat like me, uh you can get plenty of calories to maintain your body weight with I eat within a six hour time window each day. Uh, one meal I can't really do it's and get enough calories to keep my body weight uh, at um, and yeah, uh, another example is it, it's actually in a way led to the popularization of intermittent fasting being a thing on the internet. And it's called a 5 2 intermittent fasting, where a person, two consecutive days a week, they eat only about five, 600 calories. Mm. The other five days eat normally. So, five to 600 calories is not enough to keep your, your liver glycogen, which is glucose stores, replete. Mm-hmm. So, you'll be ketogenic on those two days. And we, so we did a study in collaboration with a group in England, uh, in overweight women, uh, genetically or based on family history anyway, at risk for breast cancer. So they're over, being overweight is a risk factor in itself. Um, and they were randomly assigned to 5-2 intermittent fasting or um, daily reduction in calories, but in that control group, the people ate breakfast, lunch, dinner, Mm -hmm. and each meal had about 20% fewer calories than they would normally eat. So they're 20% calorie restriction. Yep. So they're eating out, they're eating throughout the waking period, but they're doing portion control. So they're eating 20% less. And then the other people are on this five, two schedule, but they can eat as much as they want, except on those two days. That's right. And, and we figured kind of did a calculation that the weekly calorie intake of both groups should be about the same. And it apparently was because over a six month period of the study, their body weights decreased by the close to the same amount, mm-hmm. about 8% of their initial eight to 10% of their initial body weight. So we, we saw improvements, a lot of health indicators in both groups. Mm-hmm. Um, improved glucose regulation, um, improved uh, markers of inflammation, so mm-hmm. reduced inflammation. But the group on 5 2 intermittent fasting had um, statistically significantly better improvement in insulin sensitivity, uh, glucose regulation. Um, so we published that paper in 2011 and Then a producer at the BBC named Michael Mosley is an MD. He saw, you know, he kept up in the literature, particularly things coming from the UK. And he picked up on that paper when it came out. And he did a documentary on intermittent fasting. uh, It aired on the BBC in 2013. I think it's called Eat Fast, Live Longer. Um, So he came to my lab and... Walter Longo's lab in California and Krista Verdi up in Chicago. And um, and he ended up doing this. He tried like doing this 
five days, uh, consecutive days a month, don't eat hardly anything. And he didn't like, he kind of liked this five, two intermittent fast. Mm -hmm. He didn't, we didn't, he didn't do the daily time restricted eating, which I think is easier for people to incorporate into their daily routine. Um, particularly if you're, you're skipping breakfast, you just get up, go to work mm -hmm. and you can still, you can still, you know, have lunch and maybe a, a dinner, at least a early dinner with people and still get, get the benefits. Yeah. So anyway, this metabolic switch from glucose to ketones defines, uh, whether an eating pattern uh, is an it's, intermittent fasting eating pattern. I see. Yeah. So, so, so it's all based on, yeah, if you make the switch from using glucose to fuel your cells to using ketones, that's, you know, if, if you're not getting to that ketogenic state, then you're not actually fasting. You haven't gone long enough. Right. What? So, I, so I have a couple of questions here, um, just to give people a sense for like the energetics and, and how these different fuel sources are working. So you can use sugar, like glucose to run your cells. You can use, um, ketones to run your cells. So question one is, why why is glucose the default? Why do our cells sort of prefer to use glucose first if they're given the choice of both? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. It, it had, I think it's an evolutionary thing. Um, you know, I mentioned it takes a while to mobilize the ketones. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this has to do, like if you consider you're, you're a prey animal, Mm -hmm. And there's a predator, and you have to escape from that predator, right? Yeah, you don't have so, ten minutes to to get yourself together. No, you don't have ten minutes. It has yeah. to be really rapid. And these hormones I didn't mention adrenaline or epinephrine. So when you're under stress, as you well know, Nick, your brain controls that stress response. Um, and causing release of adrenaline and cortisol from the adrenal glands. That happens very quickly mm -hmm. and in you know, less than a minute in a matter of over a period of seconds, it's starting to go. And the, the adrenaline and the cortisol kind of work together. Uh, one thing that the cortisol do, it does is it kind of helps it, it, it promotes an increase in blood glucose. And so you get that rapid energy source available. Uh, so kind of the bottom line is the, the glucose seems to be like a key thing in acute stress responses and survival under those conditions. The, the using fats and ketones is more of a long-term survival Mm -hmm. mechanism when an organism hasn't been able to acquire food for days or weeks or mm -hmm. some animals actually yeah. humans can go for a month or more without mm -hmm. any so, calorie. you know glucose can can be burned for energy more quickly so in cases where you know you're in a life or death situation out in the wild as a prey animal or something, and you need to suddenly use uh, a lot of a lot of energy right now to engage in say, like a ballistic movement to escape a predator, glucose would naturally be preferred because it's going to enable you to do that quicker. Yeah, and then in the case of athletes, then kind of one extrapolation of that is that sprinters and you know, people who are doing things that require short bursts mm -hmm. of energy. Uh, you know, they aren't going to benefit much mm -hmm. from being in a ketogenic state. Mm -hmm. or is, is that true? All. Yeah. Cause the prediction would be that, you know, if you were a sprinter, um, you know, you're not going to break the world record if you're in ketosis. Right. But, but on the other hand, endurance, if you're an endurance athlete, the converse may be true. And mm -hmm. there's evidence for this and we can talk about why, uh, <laughs> A lot of endurance athletes, especially ones that are making money, <laughs> to, uh, are using ketone ester. It's kind of a big thing now. Uh, Meaning like uh, they're supplementing with ketones? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Interesting. So, so fasting is defined by the switch from using glucose to using ketones. Um, we just talked about sort of why the body might want to use one versus the other. It has something to do maybe with 
um, you know, the dynamics of energy use, whether or not you need it immediately right now, all at once or, or not. Um, what is going on when this metabolic, like in the cells, when this metabolic switch is happening, what are some of the more salient things that are happening, um, at the cellular level when it comes to things like, um, say, uh, inflammation or, uh-huh. or getting into what's going on in neurons? Okay. So I, I can, there I can talk about changes that occur with a, dur- during a, like a single period of being in a ketogenic state versus uh, intermittent Repeated. metabolic switching over periods of weeks and months. Okay. Uh, so the ketones, as you said, are fuel for the cells. Uh, and couple of things happen. One is, so, so both ketones and glucose are used in the mitochondria to produce ATP. Mm-hmm. Uh, when ketones are used, there are less free radicals produced by the mitochondria uh, per amount of ATP produced. I see. So, so if I start fasting today, when I'm going into ketosis, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours later, there's going to be uh, a reduction in the amount of free radicals that yeah. my mitochondria produce. Yeah. And there's also signaling. Uh, th- th- this is evolutionarily thinking. It's kind of an interesting thing that there's a lot of evidence now that ketones, they're not just an energy source for neuro- for cells like neurons or whatever cell. They also have signaling functions. That it is to say they can a- affect the expression of genes Mm -hmm. in cells. They can either turn them on or off. So ketones uh, can turn off or on genes. And a number of genes are being identified. um, You know, hopefully we'll talk a lot about the brain, which is what my expertise is. Uh, My own lab, uh, well, let's go back. There's There's a scientist out in California, Eric Verdon, who, he was like, one of the first people to recognize their signaling functions for these ketones, their affect gene expression. And he has evidence that these ketones actually affect um, kind of the organization of the structure of, of the DNA, I guess you'd say in the nucleus by modifying proteins that are called histones. Mm. Uh, and so that's one thing we found that, main ketone, beta-hydroxybutyrate, or BHB, it will activate two transcription factors in neurons. Uh, One is called CREB, and the other is called NF-kappa-B. CREB is very interesting from the standpoint of neurons because it's well known to play important roles in neuroplasticity, the learning and memory, the formation of new synapses or even a process called neurogenesis where mm-hmm. new neurons are produced from stem cells. I see. So CREB, CREB is like a signal that tip, anything that induces something like neuroplasticity, CREB will often turn on. CREB will be the thing that sort of turns on the genes you need for that plasticity, the things yeah. that are going to result in like more protein in the synapses. So you're saying the ketones can directly trigger that cascade of events. Yeah, that's right. And NF-kappa-B is an interesting story. It was initially, uh, well, discovered and talked a lot about uh, by people who study uh, blood cells. Um, and, and there it, it was, and it, do, it does, it can have a pro-inflammatory effect. It can promote inflammation. But it turns out it can also interestingly prevent cell death so it's, it's it, kind of, it kind of makes sense um and we we'd found in in cultured neurons that if we activate nf kappa b by pre-treating them with a inflammatory cytokine called tnf tumor necrosis factor that that would actually protect the neurons against excitotoxicity, protect them against metabolic stress. And so 
the previous work on NF kappa B had mainly they had shown associations between activation of NF kappa B and bad things going on in a tissue like mm-hmm. inflammation. But that association didn't establish cause and effect. And scientists, even scientists can jump to conclusions like this. They could say, oh, NF kappa B is activated in these inflamed tissues that must be causing or contributing to the inflammation or be a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But it turns out it's it's actually an adaptive stress response the NF kappa B activation, the cells are responding, in the case of the neurons, to TNF, which can potentially cause problems in a way that uh, make the neurons more resistant to stress in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so we um, the ketones. We found ketone, the way it activates, we found that it increases the production of BDNF, mm-hmm which is a neurotrophic factor, a protein produced and released from neurons that promotes the growth uh, and survival of the neurons that release it or adjacent neurons with it interacting with. We found that the ketones induce production of BD- BDNF. I see. So in general, it seems like the ketones are turning on pathways in the cell that have to do with growth and plasticity. Yes. And stress resistance. Stress resistance. Yeah, which is and, important. And so, okay, so you've got more plasticity, you've got more stress resistance or resilience of the cells, and then that's also coming with um, uh, less oxidative stress because you've got fewer free radicals. Yeah, and these are kind of acute things that are happening, well, relatively acute over many, many minutes to hours in a ketogenic state. But then I mentioned early on that it takes, for example, improvements in in insulin sensitivity, um, reductions in blood pressure. We could talk about that. Neuroprotective effects we've seen in my lab. Um, those we don't see these for at least two weeks to a month after the uh, initiation of intermittent fasting. I see. So, so, so most of the effects you're talking about. If you go into ketosis once, like today, you won't necessarily see all the, those things happening. You need to be doing this um, day, day by day for an extended period. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and we've um, I've written a lot of papers on this. So kind of maybe the most important one was the New England Journal of Medicine review article that uh, I wrote with a colleague of mine, Rafa de Cabo. And that was in 2019. And... One point we made in there is we think, and elsewhere we published that, the reason it takes so much time, weeks, a month or more to see, you know, see the kind of changes you would want to see when you go to the clinic and talk to your doctor and he does blood work, uh, you know, measure glucose, measure or measure your blood pressure and so on. Um, So... These intermittent periods, so daily time-restricted eating, for example. Uh, So for a certain time period each day, say four to six hours, you're in the ketogenic state. And during that time, pathways are activated in neurons that and and other cell types that kind of enhance their stress resistance and also help them uh, conserve resources. Uh, for example, proteins, protein synthesis goes down. Mm. And that's because it's mTOR pathway, which maybe people have heard about, goes down. So in the fasted state, um, cells go into a conserve resources stress resistance mode. Autophagy is increased. mTOR, which is kind of a key pathway where amino acids are, that stimulates amino acid uptake and protein synthesis, that's turned down and but then in the recovery period eating after fasting then things are sw- switched back into a growth and plasticity mode mm-hmm. uh, protein synthesis goes up so cells can produce some new the proteins they need to grow um, since aut- autophagy was increased during the fasting period garbage has been cleared out 
uh, we think during the recovery period is when mitochondrial biogenesis occurs, an increase in the number of new of mitochondria in cells. So the switching back and forth between uh, conserve resources, stress, resistance, and growth and plasticity mode over time is what can help optimize health. And this is analogous to exercise, Nick. I mean, so your your muscle cells don't get bigger during exercise. Mm -hmm. They get bigger during the recovery. But if you don't exercise, they're not going to get bigger, stronger, and healthier. During the recovery phase. During the recovery yeah. phase. So, so you yeah, have so to have this. It's all about these repeated bouts of stress, rest, stress, rest. Yeah. And, and in the case of fasting, it, it's a it's a stress, um, you know, mild, moderate. It's something that we've evolved to experience, same as exercise, right? Mm -hmm. And for those reasons, those two particular uh, things we can do seem to have robust effects on health and disease resistance. Mm -hmm. And it's because... Those are probably, I'd make the case, the two most important things uh, that we had to be, uh, that organisms have to be able to do when they're in a stressful condition, no food, mm -hmm. right? They have to be able to uh, resist that stress, keep but keep functioning at a high level. Yep. Right? Um, so we're geared for that. Um yeah, and, and also in the case of neurons, just like when you exercise your muscles, when your neurons are active, it's a stress on them. There's mm -hmm. big sodium influx, calcium influx, free radical production. You know, there's big increase in energy demand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, almost, I think almost what you're saying is, you know, at a cellular molecular level, you know, studying really hard, thinking very hard, problem solving, using your neurons is almost analogous to, you know, resistance training or exercise of your muscle yeah. cells. Um, it's this or, or aerobic or aerobic training yeah. or aerobic training. Yeah. So it's yeah. this acute stress that if it's coupled with being followed by this rest period, which, you know, for your brain would literally mean going to sleep at some point. Um, yeah. That's where that's where the growth actually happens. So it has to be sort of triggered initially with the the stressor, the active use yeah. of either the muscle cell or or the neurons. Um, but that growth will only happen afterwards in the rest phase. Exactly. Yep. And so, what can you? I want to. You've written a lot about this, and it's it's fascinating, and I think it helps people think about like why things are set up this way. You know, like why do we even have these different metabolic modes we go into? Why do we have to? Um, you know, acutely go into uh, active mode and then rest mode. Um, you know, is is it because all of this stuff was baked into our behavior naturally? So if we think about humans living as traditional hunter gatherers and they're basically in their wild state, um, or we think about wild animals, they don't have civilization. They don't have this infinite abundance of food, so they're constantly, you know, going out and exercising in order to get their food. Yeah. And they're stopping to eat their food. And just based on the natural cycles of feasts and famine out in the wild, people were forced to engage in intermittent fasting, whether they wanted to or not. Is that how we start to think about why our biology works this way? Yes, I think it's an important way to think about it. Uh, it's always important to go back and try to and ask the question, well, what was the advantage or, you know, what explains why things the way, are the way they are in in biology and and, and life actually, <laughs> and you got to go back to our evolutionary roots, and and also you know so I I would consider eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner and an evening snack very abnormal from an evolutionary perspective, and mm -hmm. our genetic constitution. We, we didn't evolve with that eating pattern, so it's very unnatural. And our systems, uh, what, essentially what I've used the word, uh, our cells and organ systems become complacent. Mm. They, they aren't, they're essentially in the, the growth and growth mode all the time. 
and they're never having you know the stress resistance conserved resources mode so um so for example um we talked about oxidative stress mm -hmm. uh and and this is in, done in animals where we can directly look at the cells and look at amount of oxidative stress in the cells but um <clears throat> When animals are fed ad libitum, they have food available all the time. Mm -hmm. And particularly as they age, the ability of the cells to remove free radicals is, comp is not good as they age. But if you put them on daily calorie restriction or every other day fasting, uh, as they get old, their ability to get rid of free radicals is maintained. and. What I'm talking about specifically there is that we have genes that encode proteins that their job is to remove free radicals, the antioxidant enzymes. Mm -hmm. And and both, interestingly, both exercise and fasting will stimulate those genes. Mm -hmm. I see. So so we have nat we have natural antioxidants that get um, triggered to to do what they do. Um, when we stress our bodies either through fasting or exercise, uh, it, which is kind of interesting because normally people think about antioxidants as only things that you eat. But you, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're saying that we have endogenous antioxidants that actually come, come, come bubble up from the inside. Yeah. So <laughs> there are chemicals, a few in, in fruits and vegetables that can directly squelch free radicals. Mm -hmm. But there aren't very many. Mm. Vitamin E is one, vitamin A. Um, but these other chemicals that people... So the, the food supplement, dietary supplement industry, they kind of have it right, but not exactly. So you'll see on, on the shelves now, uh, sulforaphane or curcumin yep right uh uh resveratrol yep etc and they have the antioxidant on the bottle but those chemicals don't directly squelch free radicals in fact hmm. what they do is they they cause a stress on the cells and the cells increase production of their own antioxidant enzyme I see. And and so I guess the two things come to mind there. So one, well, so just to sort of repeat what you said and, and, and reiterate what you said, you're saying that many of these things marketed as antioxidants like resveratrol, which is like the, the so-called red wine molecule, um, they're not actually antioxidants per se. They're stressing the cells so that the cell uses its own endogenous antioxidants. The two things that come to mind there for me are um, one, I know that a lot of these compounds, including resveratrol, actually have very low bioavailability. So whether yeah. they can do this is, is one thing, but if they're not actually getting into our bodies, they're not doing it as much as we think they are. Yeah. Um, and then coupled to that is what you just told us about fasting. So fasting is a rel and exercise are reliable ways to get this endogenous antioxidant production up. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important to emphasize because those are reliable behavioral methods to yeah. induce these antioxidants that we have endogenously, but people are sort of used to and trained to think about Oh, to get antioxidants, I have to go buy a supplement or I have to eat something. Yeah, they're trained that well. They're trained by the advertisements, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I wrote a, there's a whole interesting evolutionary thing with this coevolution of plants and animals that eat plants, insects, herbivores, omnivores like us. And uh, I wrote an article for Scientific American in 2015. And kind of the take home message is that many of the chemicals that are in the skin of fruits are the uh, kind of sensitive parts of uh, vegetables, uh, vulnerable parts like broccoli, sprouts, or heads. Um, the reason those chemicals are in well, first of all, they have bitter taste. Mm -hmm. and, and second, the reason they're in the plants is to keep insects and us from eating 
any or much of that plant, yeah. right? And so, that's that's what the bitter taste really is, right? From an evolutionary perspective, it means don't eat too much of this. Yeah, yeah. And and even uh, caffeine, you know, is a, a really good insect antifeedant. Yeah. If, if you put tea leaves or coffee beans, or even you know, smash up the coffee beans, or certainly if you put pure caffeine on your kitchen table, the ants aren't going to go anywhere near them. Mm. Um, and but so sulforaphane has probably been the most studied with regards to this. So has a bitter taste. It's in you know if you've ever eaten broccoli sprouts, they're it's pretty bitter taste, right? Mm -hmm. And um, right, but there's been a lot of research on sulforaphane and very convincing evidence that. Why, why it's good for cells is it imposes uh, oxidative stress on the cells and they respond by uh, activating genes that encode antioxidant enzymes. And specifically, there's a what's called a transcription factor that is a protein that stimulates genes. Uh, that transcription factor is called NRF2. Mm -hmm. And sulforaphane essentially activates by causing oxidative stress activates that transcription factor that then bolsters antioxidant defenses. So that's one clear example where there's this chemical that definitely acts through this pathway. So furafane's contrast to resveratrol is a little bit more bioavailable. It, it, that, that means that when we eat it, a lot of it gets into our system and our cells will be exposed to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. So when we think about sort of uh, this intermittent metabolic switching, so, you know, it sounds like the, the ancestral state or the natural state of human beings and probably pretty much all animals is some level or some pattern of intermittent metabolic switching. Um, you know, animals out in the wild, don't have all of the food they need all of the time. Yeah. So in some sense, we're not built to just live in that state of food surplus. Um, thinking about, I want to get back to ketosis. So we sort of talked about intermittent fasting going into and out of ketosis, you know, every say, day or two, let's say. What happens if you go into ketosis and you stay there for a more extended period of time? And the first sort of piece of this I want to ask you about is, um, you know, I'll remind people who don't know, uh, the ketogenic diet has actually been known, I think for a long time, going back to the ancient Greeks to be a way to treat epilepsy. And so it's clearly, it's been known for a long time. It's doing something in the brain and it has this effect on epilepsy. Um, before you get into the details there, let me just ask you, uh, if somebody just goes into, just through dieting, goes into ketosis for one day, two day, three days, maybe several days. What does it feel like? Does does it, what are sort of the psychoactive effects here? Is your mind affected in terms of your ability to uh, feel like you have mental clarity or mental energy? What does it actually feel like subjectively? Uh, are you making a distinction between ketosis due to uh, you know in the fasted state or, and ketosis uh, uh, induced by essentially eating a lot of fats? Um, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Let's just assume okay. it's let's just assume it's through fasting initially. Um, but if there's okay. a difference there, I think that's that's worth talking about. Yeah, if a person normally, so for example, if you normally eat breakfast and you've done that for years and years, and then tomorrow you don't eat breakfast, you're going to feel hungry and irritable in the morning. Maybe can't concentrate, um, and that's true. And and this is also gets back to this two week to a month mm -hmm. situation. If you are adapted to intermittent fasting over a period of several weeks, then in the morning you're adapted to not eating breakfast. You will you won't feel hungry. You'll be more alert, better able to concentrate, uh, and focus on on what you're doing. Uh, Many people will find that, but you have to get adapted to it. It takes time. You know, you, you studied neuroendocrine system, right? Yes. And um, 
those those changes there's all sorts of hormones involved in regulating app, regulating appetite right mm -hmm. leptin and ghrelin leptin tells you you're you're full don't eat anymore ghrelin goes to your hypothalamus how these changes occur and you yeah. you perceive your yeah, it it takes time. It takes time for all these systems to to switch and to orchestrate all of the changes that will get you yeah. to the the next steady state. Yeah, as it does with exercise. Mm -hmm. Right. If if you've been sedentary and you go out and try to run even three miles, you probably won't be able to do it. You you won't feel good, and you may say, "Well, I don't like that. I'm not going to do that anymore." Right, right. It's kind of the same idea with fasting. You know, you've yeah. got to kind of stick with it and get get adapted to it. And mm -hmm. then once you're adapted, you'll your brain will function really well. It's, it's mm -hmm. very true with exercise and with kind of the another way to look at this, Nick, is that everybody knows this that uh, after you eat a meal, particularly if there's carbs in it, mm -hmm. you feel sleepy often, right? Yes. A big uh, carb heavy meal. Right. So sleepy is the opposite of your your brain being sharp and functioning well so they can focus on what you're doing. So, you know, just looking and again, get back to evolution, that makes sense that, okay, in animals, whatever, uh, wolves have killed a buffalo and eaten a, you know, they can just, they can sleep for a while and they, their brain doesn't have, to, they're good to go for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So again, this all kind of makes sense. Um, but, and and then, you know, for us, we don't like to feel hungry. And, but that's, hunger is there for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a motivator. Yeah, yeah. Um, motivator to get food. <laughs> but, but interestingly, um, once you're adapted to these short, very short term fast, right, of whatever, 16 hours, once you're adapted to that, you won't feel hungry. Actually, I think a lot of people I've talked to, myself included, you'll appreciate the food more when you do eat it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I think everyone, it's easy to forget this, but I think everyone knows it from experience. It's also just kind of common sense, right? Like the more you're deprived of something, the the sweeter it is once you get it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. When you're dying of thirst, that glass of water is, you know, like unlike anything else. Um, and, you know, likewise, if you force yourself to be a little bit hungry, <laughs> hungrier for longer or more frequently, um, when you do sit down to eat, the the tastes are just enhanced, literally. Yeah. We're intelligent beings. We can put off a reward if we know that it benefits us to put off the reward. <laughs> That's right. One. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, so I want to ask you about here that's related to metabolic switching and ketosis, all of the stuff that we've been talking about is if we think about the average American today, and the average American, you know, for many, many decades at this point is been eating, um, you know, the so-called Western diet, which just means it's calorie dense and it's freely available. Um, we're essentially never the average American eating the average American diet is essentially, um, never fasting. So we always have glucose in the system to use as energy. We're never going into ketosis um, if if we're uh, like the average person. What is the connection there, if anything, to um, chronic disease in general, but neurodegenerative disease in particular, things like Parkinson's, things like Alzheimer's? You're, you were getting into that earlier, but is there a connection between um, never being in in uh, intermittent metabolic switching, never being in ketosis, and developing these neurodegenerative diseases later in life? Yeah, uh, there's, well, I can kind of divide this up into animal studies and human studies. Mm -hmm. So in humans, um, epidemiological studies, uh, pretty convincing now that people uh, with obesity uh, and insulin resistance are at increased risk for Alzheimer's and age-related cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're also at a bigger risk for stroke because of the cardiovascular effects, atherosclerosis. And um, they're, they're in a state of chronic inflammation. Uh, they're in a state where 
their cells are not able to deal with free radicals very well. That can actually increase risk for cancer. So that's one thing that's very clear. This Western type eating pattern being in a, you know, never getting into a ketogenic state. It's a big risk factor for most cancers. We, all the major cancers, cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, and in the case, so Parkinson's, the data, as far as the data are a little less clear, but we do see in our animal models that intermittent fasting protects the dopamine mm -hmm. producing neurons. I see. And just a uh, quick question on the cancer side. Is it fair to, I mean, it seems commonsensical to make that connection to me. It seems very natural to think, okay, if we're always in feeding mode, if we're always yeah. supplying our body with all this energy, well, cancer is just unrestricted growth. So if we're always in growth mode, we're going to be more likely to push things in, in the cancer direction. Is, is that essentially what you just said there? Uh, that, and also um, there's this two-stage model for cancer development that's kind of generally accepted is that step one is there has to be some damage to genes, some mutation. Mm -hmm. that that mutation is in a gene that's involved in controlling cell growth and survival. And so that's step one. And then uh, step two is that uh, th there has to be a me mechanism to keep the cells in a growth mode. So I guess step one is mutation and then go into this continuous growth mode. If you deprive cancer cells of glucose um, in a in a dish in a in a culture dish, mm -hmm. uh, they can be very easily it, it will inhibit their growth. They can be easily killed by radiation or chemotherapy. I see. But, so, but but if you if you give them ketones, uh, and in case of most cancers, not all, uh, they're. Uh, they're still susceptible to being killed by the the radiation. Yeah. So the, so the cancer cells, maybe even more so than non-cancer cells, really want to use glucose. They as want the to use glucose. Yeah. So yeah. if if you don't put, you know, even even if the cancer is there, like you've create you've created the cancer through mutation. Yeah. Um, if it doesn't have the fuel to power that hypergrowth, um, it's much more easily susceptible to uh, being taken out either by the immune system or by radiation or some some kind of medical treatment. Yeah, and that it's been shown clearly in animals. You can, you, in animals, you just you take cancer cells and you put them into the animal under the skin, and a tumor will form. Or in case of like glioblastoma brain cancer, you can put glioblastoma cells in the brain and a tumor will form. And 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 the intermittent fasting and daily calorie restriction will slow the growth uh, of the cancers. And there's many human clinical trials ongoing now, mm -hmm. uh, dozens actually. Mm -hmm. where, where they're actually using fasting as part yeah. of the treatment yeah. itself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't like, so I, I've, I've rarely heard this talked about outside of conversations like this with people like you. Um, you know, I, I've seen people with cancer. Um, you know, I've talked to many people who know people who've had cancer, who've had cancer themselves. I've never encountered someone out in the wild who's had cancer and survived it or, or, you know, someone who's, you know, who I've known who's had cancer. I've never encountered a situation where their physicians were telling them anything about diet or recommending fasting or anything like that. Is that just not part of the normal uh, medical culture uh, today or, or is the evidence uh, not quite there? Or yeah. Is it's uh, so in our Western medicine, in the United States is probably the worst healthcare system around in a major industrialized country, but it's all profit driven throughout, unfortunately. Um, and so you've got big pharma making drugs. You've got the fast food industry uh, making 
uh, things that elevate our glucose and probably do other bad things to us. And then you've got uh, congressmen being lobbied, being lobbied by these industries. And then the healthcare system itself is, it's geared, it's, there's no prevention in mind, a risk, disease risk reduction. Your insurance won't uh, cover your, whatever, going to a gym every day or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, whatever. Uh, for example, in, in uh, people in lower socioeconomic status, particularly in inner cities, right? Mm -hmm. They can't even get the vegetables are very high cost. You know, they're relatively expensive uh, and so on. So there's no insurance that will, you know, help them have yeah. them more healthy. And the affordable, the affordable and available foods are exactly the foods that will cause chronic disease. Yeah, that's right. And there's no, there's no mechanism. There's a lot of industries pushing that in a way that fast food industry directly, the pharmaceutical kind of indir indirectly in that they won't make any money if people don't get sick. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they make money by someone getting a cancer, uh, being, you know, diagnosed with whatever, um, Diabetes or cardiovascular disease, you know. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. They 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 do the best when there's an extended treatment that requires many many interventions over time. Right, right. So, it, you know, education is, you know, what you're doing right now. I mean, it it seems like we're kind of fighting a insurmountable battle, but you know, if people can be educated and motivated and kind of encouraged that to change it. One part of this too now is it's transgenerational, right? So kids that they grow up, if their parents, you know, for whatever reason, you know, don't exercise and eat mostly junk food, those kids are highly likely to adopt the same patterns. Yep. Right. And what you learn during those formative years often sets the stage for the rest of your life. So there has to be some mechanism mechanism put in place to address that. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, switching gears a little bit, or or at least on the theme of, uh, I mean, staying on the theme of, you know, thinking about prevention um, and, and the maintenance of health. You know, we've talked about um, intermittent fasting and fasting in general. We've talked about exercise, how if you um, stress the body in the right way, in the right pattern, it can actually have adaptive effects. I think the technical term for this is hormesis, and you've written about this. Um, but on this general subject of hormesis and and challenging the body in, in an intermittent fashion, um, another type of challenge that I think is really interesting, and you're definitely seeing this in certain parts of the culture, has to do with things like temperature and hypoxic stress. So um, I, I want to talk about temperature for a minute and how that affects things like just physiology in general, but things like mitochondrial health and metabolism. Uh, a lot of people are getting really into things like ice baths, you know, going into the cold on purpose. They're getting into things like saunas, going into the heat um, on purpose. Is this a type of stressor that's analogous to things like exercise um, that that will have actually uh, potentially adaptive uh, beneficial effects? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, the the benefits of heat or cold exposure, you know, intermittent heat and cold exposure relative to exercise and fasting, I think are not as great, but there are benefits. We've, we've got a, a sauna, infrared sauna, and I usually do it every other day or so for like 45, 50 minutes, get up to like 130, 140 degrees. So you sweat. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll start with heat. So there's some there's these proteins called heat shock proteins. Mm -hmm. They're very well known, uh, huge literature on this, and they were discovered. It's pretty simple. People, 
they they had cultured cells and essentially put them in they'd have one incubator at like normal body temperature yeah and then another incubator at say uh would be the equivalent of like 105 degrees fahrenheit body temperature mm -hmm. so that's not outside that's the actual body temperature and then they just they looked at changes in gene expression and they found the certain set of genes uh, heat shock genes that are responsive to this and they call it a shock heat shock mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. heat stress and this happens pretty quickly within tens of minutes of changing temperatures uh, these heat shock proteins go up and then the function of these heat shock proteins is pretty interesting it it pre prevents the formation and accumulation of misfolded proteins um in alzheimer's disease parkinson's disease huntington's disease one clear problem is that the neurons are accumulating misfolded proteins misfolded proteins and so that's pretty interesting um you know, we never did that. We, I don't think those experiments have been done of like taking a mouse model of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and then, you know, doing what kind of the equivalent of a human, you know, get once a day or whatever, get elevate the outdoor temperature so that the yeah, the mouse, a daily mouse. So. Right, and then and then do that long term and see. But it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the prediction, I guess, the prediction would be that if you were to do this before the development of disease, you would yeah. either uh, prevent yeah. it or or push it out in time. Yes, that's right. Now, cold, then, okay, yeah. What about cold? Cold's interesting too. Um, right. So I'll, there, I'll talk about. Uh, some proteins called mitochondrial uncoupling proteins, or UCPs. Uh, I'll try to streamline this as well as I can. So um, rats and mice, uh, they don't, well, some animals don't shiver in the cold. Um, they will actually generate heat, and, and specifically there are these cells called brown fat cells mm -hmm. that are producing the heat when the the temperature goes down outside a lot and, and well essentially when the body temperature starts to go down mm -hmm. so what's happening there is when the body temperature starts to go down the genes that produce proteins called uncoupling proteins are turned on and the uncoupling protein what it does is it, it causes the mitochondria to produce heat instead of ATP or produce heat in addition to some ATP. Okay. Okay. So these brown fat cells, which these rodents and, and some other animals have a lot of humans don't have much of these brown fat cells. Um, interestingly, we found that in neurons, I kind of did the opposite experiment I talked about of putting cultured cells from in a hot we took we took cultured neurons from the brain of rodents of rats and we put them in the refrigerator <laughs> all right <laughs> and then or we had controls that we didn't put in the refrigerator and then we took them out of the refrigerator and then we I can't remember how long we incubated them for a while longer. Then we looked at gene expression, and we found that uh, uncoupling protein was increased. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then we found that using a drug that activates uncoupling protein in the absence of any change in temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we we take temperature out of the equation. If we activate the uncoupling protein directly, it protect, protects neurons against a variety of types of stress. Uh, in fact, there's there's a company now that's 
uh, doing clinical trials of this drug. It's actually a very well-known drug in chemistry, and it's called 2,4-dinitrophenol or DNP. And um, people actually used to take this to lose weight, mm -hmm. you know, because they it causes uncoupling. So they'll be essentially the calories will be used for generating heat, and their body temperature goes up. They lose weight. Hmm. But a few of these people had the bright idea: okay, I'm taking this amount of DNP, and I'm losing whatever two pounds a week. Hey, I'll take a lot more and I'll lose, oh. you know, in two weeks I can lose 40 Four pounds. pounds. And yeah. they died. Because they just overheated? Yeah, essentially they, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Um, so there's a weight loss, there was a weight loss drug, 2 4 dinitrophenol. It affected mitochondrial uncoupling protein. It did cause them to lose weight. Uh, but you can't have too much of a good thing. So people were essentially overdosing on this drug and overheating. Yeah, but, but this come so lower dose, much much lower dose, hundredfold lower doses we find are neuroprotective in animal models, and um, many drugs that human that humans are prescribed now, mm -hmm. you can overdose on. Mm -hmm. I mean, opioids is we know all about that, right? You can yeah die if you take too much, but there there are many other drugs that mm -hmm. can kill you. So there's always kind of yeah. this. This ideal range, uh, in this case of a drug that's an induce, inducing stress, but I think this is a, an idea in terms of can we uh, at least mimic some of the effects of exercise or mm -hmm. like restriction by yeah. some sort of pharmacological. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in you have a review a review paper um, on hormesis that was really interesting. And, and you know, you've got this really interesting table in there where you talk about different drugs that seem to um, have, at least at certain doses, have neuroprotective effects that might be able to mimic, you know, the hormesis-like effects of things like fa fasting and stuff. And so this is a really interesting idea. Um, and I want to ask you about some more of these drugs. So you just told us the, the example of 2,4-dinitrophenol. It actually did help people lose weight. We know the mechanism by which it was doing that, and it had to do with the mitochondrial uncoupling stuff you were just talking about. But of course, you then said uh, you could have too much of a good thing, and people started overdosing on it. The other type of drug I want to ask you about, because you have it in this table here, um, and it's also similar, I think, to the ones that are in the news a lot right now, are these GLP-1 um, mm -hmm. weight loss drugs. So can you tell, is there anything interesting going on there, and are there any... Uh, potential uh, uh, words of caution you might have given what you just told us about the, the other weight loss drug. So one quick comment before the GLP-1 analogs. Uh, mm -hmm. um, okay. So back in the 1990s, we did these studies with, uh, uh, it's called 2-deoxyglucose. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, a molecule very similar to glucose, but it cells cannot use it to produce ATP. And there's, anyway, the bottom line is it competes for glucose in the cell. So if you feed it to an animal, the cells will think they aren't getting enough glucose or as much glucose as they had been. And in fact, if you give it to animals, it will cause them to start producing ketones. Mm. It tricks the whole system into thinking that there's not enough glucose around. And so we found that that 2-deoxyglucose was beneficial in our animal models of stroke and um, Parkinson's disease anyway. Okay, so for the GLP-1 analogs, so this is an interesting story, uh, and I know a lot about it because... Uh, so I was a lab laboratory chief at the National Institute on Aging for 20 years. And so I had a big neuroscience lab with about 50 people in it or more. And one of the investigators in another laboratory, Josephine Egan, who focused on diabetes, mainly from a clinical standpoint, she developed... Uh, 
a GLP-1 analog. That is a protein that's similar to GLP-1, but its amino acid sequence is a little different. Um, what is GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1? It's a, a hormone. It's produced by cells in your gut. It's released into the bloodstream when you eat a meal. Uh, and, and in particular, glucose seems, seems to be the most important stimulator. So it's released into the blood. It does two things that are good for glucose regulation. Well, fairly directly. One is it stimulates insulin production by the beta cells in the pancreas. So when GLP-1 goes into the blood, that it's playing an important role in that rise in the insulin mm -hmm. when you eat a meal. So the insulin's function is to stimulate cells so that they remove glucose from the blood. Muscle cells, liver cells, brain cells, whatever. Okay. A uh, second way that GLP-1 improves glucose regulation, it actually increases the sensitivity of cells to insulin so that it takes less insulin uh, to stimulate removal of glucose from the blood. I see. Okay. So then at NIH, so, so, uh, so is that so is that does that mean it, it, it improves insulin sensitivity? Yes. Okay. It does. Okay. Yep. Acts on your muscle cells, liver cells, uh, even your brain cell to do that. Now, GLP-1 itself, it doesn't stay around in the blood very long. Mm -hmm. The reason is there's a an enzyme it's called a protease that cleaves the GLP-1 protein. And when that enzyme cleaves it, it's no longer able to act on cells. Mm -hmm. So your body releases it naturally after meals that are high in glucose. This, uh, this thing improves insulin sensitivity, um, but it gets enzymatically broken down quickly. So, so it's not sort of meant to stick around for very long. Right. And so these, the, these GLP-1 analogs, essentially what they did is they changed the amino acids in the region of the protein where the enzyme cleaves. Mm, so it can't be so cleaved. It can be cleaved. So it stays around hours, hours, hours. And, and most of these are given by injection. There's even a once weekly, mm -hmm. which is real nice for di people with type 2 diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. Just subcutaneous once a week. That's it. Yeah. And so what... So, what other effects does GLP one have? I, I, because uh, you know, I would imagine, because I don't know all of the biology here, but presumably it does other things. And are there any potential downsides or hazards that people should think about here? You know, especially given the history of, you know, you told us about the the two four dinitrophenol drug earlier. Um, there's been other weight loss drugs in the past that yeah. act on cannabinoid receptors, and they help people lose weight. But then later on, we learn, you know, X, Y, or Z goes wrong, and they have to pull it from the market. Yeah, well, I, all I can say there is we'll see what happens. It has been used in in diabetes patients for a decade. I see. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. So it has already been used uh, for diabetes per se, and it's now sort of been rebranded or, or co-opted yeah. into the weight loss area. Yeah, and, and the reason is uh, a third action of TLP-1, and that's on neurons in the hypothalamus that control appetite. It, GLP-1 suppresses appetite. Which neurons is this acting on? Uh, oh, my gosh. Would it be the, so is it AGR, which is it? AG, AGRP, AGRP, is, AGRP is the hunger-promoting neurons. Okay, so then it's the, the other ones. It's acting on POMC pom neurons? POMC, POM yeah. POM yeah. Okay, so it's, it's probably stimulating POMC neurons. Yes, yes. I see, okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, so okay, so that's how it's acting. It it isn't really acting in a like a adaptive stress response. I don't. I wouldn't consider it like an adaptive stress response mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, we did find we started to look at the effects of GLP one and 
and the the first analog that was made at NIA uh, called Xenotide or Xenon4 on neurons, first in culture and then in animals, and found that it did have direct neuroprotective effects. In fact, based on work that uh, uh, Nigel Gregg, uh, who was in my laboratory then, uh, there have been two clinical trials in patients with Parkinson's disease of uh, GLP-1 analog and with promising results. They're doing a phase three trial. So I don't know about long-term, you know, adverse effects. Um, you know, for example, I, I don't think there's been much at all done in terms of cancers. Uh, so anyway, so, so far it looks fairly safe, but I'm not promoting it. I, I promote exercise, eat a healthy diet composition, you know, moderation in calorie intake, maybe intermittent fasting. Um, you know, I think sauna is good. I think the, the cold exposure is fine. I, there's, those I'm, I, you know, you and I think are on similar wavelength when you start tweaking with some specific, some hormone, hormonal signaling pathway like that, uh, yeah, there can be unintended consequences, yeah. um, and often, you know, oftentimes uh, the the biology is incompletely understood. We we understand one piece of it, but we don't even realize uh, some larger picture it belongs to. Like, for example, you know, naturally, as um, you know, given my scientific background, like when I look at uh, these GLP one agonists, you know, you mentioned they 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 have a specific protein domain that makes them rapidly cleaved by proteases. Um, that evolved for some reason. Um, yeah. That's that's not a design flaw. Yeah. Um, and so I would imagine that keeping these things around, around, you know, constitutively or at least for for hours at a time, is probably eventually going to do something else that we're we're we, like we don't even know about yet. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I want to ask you more about behavioral and lifestyle things, uh, including what you do in your own life around diet and exercise. Before we get there. I want to ask you one more question about ketosis. Um, so things that, that we've covered so far, we talked about what ketosis is. We talked about ketones like BHB, how they can be used in place of glucose. Um, we talked about how going into ketosis can um, lead to a number of beneficial changes, um, decreases in um, oxidative stress and free radical production, uh, increases in neuroplasticity, um, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about a lot of good things. Is there any downside to ketosis? If you were to stay into ketosis permanently for days and days and weeks at a time, are there any detrimental effects? Well, in the case of fasting, you know, starvation, you start to lose muscle mass when you get too low. But in the case of like ketogenic diet. Yeah. If you're on a ketogenic diet, um, you're getting your, your caloric needs met. Are there any, yeah. Are, do those people have any symptoms or, or are there any downsides? Well, if those people are eating uh, a lot of saturated fat, mm -hmm. there's downsides for the cardiovascular system. I think it's, you know, my looking at the data, and there have been a lot of studies on this, uh, it's not good. If, on the other hand, if you're eating good fats, so omega-3 fatty acids, for example, I don't know, but I would think that you're not getting the stress recovery effects that you see with intermittent fasting. In other words, yep. uh, you, you're not really uh, stressing the, you know. Mm -hmm. you're, you're only getting sort of one one side of the coin. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, it's, based on everything that you've studied and, and we've talked about so far, it seems like um, – you know, a lot of people get obsessed with trying to think about the right diet. Like, should I be on the ketogenic diet or should I be on a high carb diet or some other diet? It seems like your point of view is probably that it's not so much about having a diet. It's about going through this pattern of challenging and then recovering and going through this sort of in intermittent uh, metabolic switching pattern. And, you know, perhaps the details of what your diet is don't matter as much as making sure that you have that sort of back and forth pattern. Uh, the details of the diet matter some, but mm -hmm. 
regardless of the of the composition of the diet, the intermittent fasting is beneficial. In animal studies, for example, we put rats or mice on a diet where very high in saturated fat, put fructose in their drinking water, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. uh, and they become obese and diabetic. If we put them on intermittent fasting, it can, that has a very clear beneficial effect. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if one looks at lifespan, the, uh, well, first of all, the animals on the McDonald's type diet have a short lifespan. Intermittent fasting can extend that somewhat, but it doesn't extend it as much as it does uh, in rats and mice that are on a healthier diet. I see. So, so in other words, you can you can extend the lifespan through intermittent fasting even if you maintain a poor diet. So, even if you're continuing junk food, if you just add the intermittent fasting, well, there can be longevity benefits. They're just not going to be as big as if you also yeah. change the diet. That's true. But I, I'm I'm not saying it's okay to eat, you know. So it's like let's. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I'm not I'm not saying you're advocating that. But like, so let's let's say someone eats a very poor Western diet right now. Step right. one could just be start intermittent fasting, and step two can be then slowly start to substitute for different foods, and that yeah. each of those steps would move you in a good direction. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and exercise. And and keep your mind intellectually challenged. Mm -hmm. What um? So you mentioned earlier a few things about yourself. You said that you know you've you've been I think a runner for many years, and it sounds like you do daily intermittent fasting. Can you just talk a little bit more about um what your current sort of um eating and fasting schedule and exercise schedule is, and how long you've been maintaining that? Yeah. So <clears throat> I. I get up, well, since I retired, I get up about seven in the morning. Then I um, <clears throat> I write, or I have a podcast too, I do that. Anyway, the, the mornings, I kind of keep my mind intellectually challenged while I'm in the fasted state. Then I exercise usually for an hour between 11 and 12. And then I eat uh, a meal. And then usually in mid-afternoon, I'll have some healthy thing, just simple thing, apple, carrots, uh, sometimes some whole grain bagel with olive oil or something. And then I have uh, dinner about six. And the composition of my diet is it's mainly vegetables, nuts, fruits, fish. Um, I do eat whole grains. I mentioned Whole wheat. I eat oat, oatmeal. I'm, you know, there's there's a lot of chatter that, you know, that any grains is bad for you. But I I'm not on board with that. If you look at these blue zones, which I'm sure you've heard of, these are uh, spots in the world where the people living there have exceptional longevity. Mm -hmm. You know, and these are. There's a number of these different blue zones, and you know, so there's people with different genetic makeup, and it's not just they're all, all whatever, Japanese or Asian heritage. But as far as diet goes, uniformly those blue zones, their diet is mainly complex carbohydrates, like seventy to eighty percent of their calories is complex carbohydrates. You know, a, a root. Things like sweet potatoes, beans, um, and you know, vegetables, maybe some fruits. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're they're living ninety, hundred years old. There's a lot of centenarians in those. So, just from that alone, from the standpoint of humans, suggests that you know, eating a diet that has a lot of carbs, as long as it's you know, essentially no simple sugars. Uh, can be healthy. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of composition. I eat. Then um, what else? But then in in 2019, I had a. I used to run a lot. Do a lot of trail running. I, I mm -hmm. love running on hiking trails. And then I started to have some knee problems, 
so I switched to mountain biking. Then I had a crash on my, I crashed my mountain bike. So this is 2019. And, you know, so I'm in, in my 60s, right? And I'm riding on these highly technical trails I probably shouldn't have been riding on. But you're, as you get older, Nick, you're young now still, but as you get older, you'll find that your your mind you still think you're young but your reaction time your yeah yeah, yeah. your strength your your balance coordination they're declining even though you don't necessarily notice it that much mm-hmm. but anyway i had to i had to have three surgeries and my on my core muscles and then that screwed up my gait and then i got tendonitis in my tendons and then that's kind of an interesting story. It's just a personal story. It doesn't really have anything to do with intermittent fasting. But um, I've had pain issues in my whole life. Like I've had to sit on a donut cushion for many decades. I Even when I was in graduate school, I had like really bad heartburn that seemed to even had endoscopy and it didn't really look like any b- bad things. And, and then I had these surgeries and and the doctors were saying, well, we're surprised you're having such severe pain given what looks like on MRI or whatever. And so we did genome-wide exome sequencing on me. That means uh, it took my DNA and sequenced all the genes. And it turns out I have a mutation in a gene that encodes a voltage-dependent sodium channel that's <laughs> highly expressed in neurons that convey pain, the nociceptive neurons. Hmm. And this mutation, it's called a gain-of-function mutation. The bottom line is that the sodium channel, which controls the depolarization of of nerves, um, it opens more easily than a norm, you know. I see. So you, you, have, you, have, hyper, you, you have hyper-excitable pain neurons. Yeah. So I have a lot of pain issues now. So um, I've, I've had them, I guess I'm saying all that time, um, I've kind of had to modify my exercise accordingly. So now it's more just walking and then stationary bike where I can get my heart rate up you know, like 130 and sweat and stuff. And then, then I do mm-hmm. some kind of other mu- muscle toning stuff. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about exercise too, you know, we talked about the importance of going from you know, challenging the body to recovery phase, right? So exercising your muscles, allowing them to rest, stimulating your neurons, allowing them to take a break. That 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 pattern is very important. When it comes to the challenge side for your muscles and your cardiovascular system, so when you're exercising, um, I assume that you can exercise too much. And so what does that actually look like? And how does someone know if they are pushing their body too hard or too often? I guess you can look at a single bout of exercise. So evolution did a good job in selecting out individuals who would die if they exercised uh, in one bout of exercise. It's, you know, anybody who's been endurance athletes knows even endurance athletes, you your, your body and mind isn't going to let you go so far that you actually die like acutely. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's very rare that happens. It, you, uh, sometimes it can happen in, in people, but uh, usually they have some underlying, you know, cardiovascular problem, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as, you know, training and how much is too much over time, you know, I'm I'm not an expert on this actually, but kind of the key thing is you don't want to injure yourself, right? You can get overuse injuries. Mm-hmm. I've had a number of those things, mostly with me. It's a common mm-hmm. thing, whatever plantar fasciitis yeah. or this or that. Well, well I mean, there, I guess there's two things here. I think there's probably just the common sense side, like, right. If you're doing something so much that you're in pain, you probably have gone too far. Yeah. The piece maybe that you can speak to more is, you know, we talked, when we talk about intermittent fasting, like going, going on, off, on, off, is there something to be said about 
say not doing, uh, let, let, you know, let's say you're doing resistance training, you're lifting weights or something. Is there a benefit to you know having rest days in between exercise days versus having like two or three days of hard exercise in a row? My understanding, and I'm not expert on that, is yes, that it is a benefit to have a long, particularly for resistance training where you're like straining and actually physically damaging your muscles during that. And it's, that's been shown. Mm -hmm. uh, it may take several days to get full recovery and grow, you know, build up the muscle fibers and, and strength and mitochondrial biogenesis and all that. Aerobic exercise seems to be more amenable to daily, you know, fairly hard sessions. Um, you know, so typically endurance athletes will, I used to coach high school cross country, so I like made the training, you know, weekly schedule there. And usually it's like you, you mix it up. You do, mm -hmm. you know, some long runs at, kind of just a, a moderate intensity and then you'll maybe do one day you know intervals you know at high intensity in those intervals and then maybe throw in a one long run at higher intensity a week and i think those are just kind of standard ways that have been and and i think that's true you know the as far as injury goes you know, if you do too much speed speed workouts as runners, you're, they're much more likely to get injured, particularly these high school kids who may not even be training in the off season much. Uh, so, and you got to build up. You know, they come in in the fall, and some of them they're supposed to, but they may not have run much during the summer. So, like the first three weeks to a month. You're mainly just going on long runs and uh, maybe just some moderate, you know, short intervals. And then you kind of build up because there's a lot of things going on there. It's not just your cardiovascular and respiratory systems. It's your muscles and tendons and, you know, the, their whole, the whole chain of things that are connected and how much stress they're being put on relative to what they've been experiencing, you know, prior to starting that. You know, we, we've, we've covered a lot of ground when it comes to, uh, you know, fasting and a lot of the underlying biology and stuff. When it comes to daily intermittent fasting, you know, how would you, how would you summarize for the average person why or why not they should do that and, and what the major potential benefits are if they start intermittent fasting if they are used to the standard American pattern of just eating all day. Okay. When you start again, you'll you'll feel hungry and irritable during the time you hadn't previously been eating. That will dissipate. And within two weeks to four months, you will uh you'll feel more alert, more productive, particularly during the fasting period. You're gonna find you know, better mental clarity, able to focus. Um, if you start looking at health indicators, uh, if you have, if you're overweight, particularly, you'll be losing fat and particularly belly fat, the abdominal fat around your waist, which is the, the bad fat. Um, you'll have better glucose regulation and you'll, your blood pressure should go down, maybe resting heart rate go down somewhat. Um, so you'll, these are the benefits that you'll you'll reap. Um, Long-term health benefits of uh, better function and disease resistance of multiple organ systems, plus, you know, better brain function over time, so you can be more productive in your job. Which, you know, most people today, uh, well, I would say, you know. They have to use their brain a lot, and so it's really important to have it functioning well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like th there's there's many benefits to doing daily intermittent fasting beyond just weight loss. Um, so if you, but the key thing to remember, if in order to get there, is that it's going to take at least a couple weeks before your body 
gets used to it and it doesn't kind of feel like a, a struggle and a pain in the ass um, yeah. and, and for your mind to just kind of learn to ignore those those hunger signals it's it's you, the, and the only reason they're really there is because you've been eating food all the time up until this point that's right and also another tip is to if you can do it with friends or workers or say oh let's let's do this together and like talk about it now and then i Back a number of years ago, soon after intermittent fasting became like a viral thing on the internet, there's multiple companies in Silicon Valley where a lot of people are very health conscious and they they just adopt the intermittent fasting eating patterns and kind of do it together. Uh, similar with that exercise, right? If you do it with someone else, often it's funner and easier to do than just doing it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, or, yep. um, is there anything else, you know, anything that we talked about that you want to reiterate or do you, th that you think is worth mentioning again, so that, um, so that people just keep it top of mind? Uh, yeah. If, if you have, uh, if you or our friends or relatives have some medical condition that evidence indicates is intermittent fasting can benefit, you might want to, tell them about it. So there'll be obesity, type two diabetes. Um, and also there are many clinical trials going on. Uh, now over 200 clinical trials of intermittent fasting are ongoing in various diseases, uh, a lot of different cancers, um, a lot of inflammatory disorders, inflammatory bowel disorders, disorders, um, like Crohn's, for example. Um, what else? Some looking at the brain, we actually have a study that was just submitted for publication where we looked at effects of intermittent fasting on the brains of people at risk for cognitive impairment because they had obesity and insulin resistance. And we did a battery of cognitive tests, psychological tests. We did imaging of their brain to look at size of different brain regions and maybe more interestingly at neural network activity using something called functional MRI. And then we did a lot of, we're doing a lot of blood work. And also uh, for many of the subjects, they agreed to for us to do a spinal tap where we can take the, it's called cerebral spinal fluid that invades the brain. So we have measured some things in there. And, but there are other studies ongoing. Um, so I think People, oh, and also talk to your physicians about it. Um, it. Increasingly, physicians have heard about intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. And if they're not up on the science, if you're, if your, say, primary care physician is not up on the science, maybe you can get them up to date <laughs> by sending them some articles or, or links to my book. But um, various resources. Oh, yeah. what, what's is that? Is that the book behind you? What's what's the title? Oh, the, yeah, that's the intermittent fasting revolution. Okay, great. The intermittent fasting revolution by Mark Matson. Yeah, and um, yeah, I that came out last year when I was at the NIH. I, I mentioned at a big lab. I didn't have time to write a book on science intermittent fasting because I was so busy with lab and uh, keeping things going and all the writing and so on. So um, even though we started the research in the 1990s, <laughs> you know, I, I finally got around to writing books. So this is, this is a science with like a couple hundred references and so on. So it's, I tried to write it so lay person can understand and hopefully it's, it was at a level that people can understand most of it and yet you know, learn a lot, a lot of new things by reading. All right. Well, Dr. Mark Matson, uh, thank you for your time. This was uh, fascinating and, and I definitely learned uh, quite a bit. Thanks, Nick. I enjoyed it and uh, take care and keep up the good work.
This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure. And vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. 